Welcome to Crossroads of Ideas, Public Perception of Science in a Post-Pandemic World. My name is Gabriella Gerhardt, and I'm the Engagement Programs Manager at the Mortgage Institute for Research. At the Mortgage Institute, we believe that society is strengthened by science. We connect with communities to spark imagination. And so we are delighted to bring you Crossroads of Ideas, uh, a partnership between the Mortgage Institute for Research, the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery, and WARF. The goal of the program is to create a space for community dialogue on issues that matter to all of us that are also subjects of research at UW-Madison and the Mortgage Institute. The series normally takes place at the Discovery Building on the UW-Madison campus. Today's session, like all Crossroads of Ideas, will feature an opportunity for questions from the audience. Please use the chat feature, which you should see to the right of the video at any time during the presentation. Before we begin, let's take a moment for a land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin-Madison at the Mortgage Institute for Research occupy Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejope since time immemorial. In an 1822 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of innovation and collaboration. Today, we in the university community respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths every day. Thank you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, we are delighted to welcome back UW-Madison's Director of Research Communication, Kelly Terrell. Kelly, take it away. Thank you, Gabriella. It's always an honor to participate in Crossroads of Ideas, so thanks for having me here tonight. It's been almost a year since I moderated my last Crossroads panel about the pandemic, and it's kind of hard to imagine. But as we'll talk about tonight, COVID has dominated a lot of our experiences this year. In keeping with the theme of this evening's discussion, the pandemic has also highlighted how important science is in our daily lives and has really reinforced how subject to political influence scientific objectivism can be. I don't know about all of you tuning in this evening, but as a professional science communicator who also trained as a scientist, I found myself letting out a breath I didn't know I'd been holding when I heard Dr. Anthony Fauci, head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, discuss in a White House press briefing just last week how liberating it was to be able to talk freely about scientific evidence, to quote, let the science speak. It's perhaps not a surprise to those of us who have followed the politicization and polarization of science over the last several decades, from climate change to yes, vaccines, that the science of COVID-19 would not be immune. And sorry, but not sorry for the bad pun. <laughs> We've seen people divide themselves on everything from whether or not to wear masks to whether or not it's safe to allow children back to in-person school. And now as the US hurries up and waits to distribute vaccines to help stop this pandemic, we're again talking about vaccine hesitancy. I'm really excited to be here with you this evening. Uh, and also to join the esteemed panelists who are prepared to talk tonight about what the pandemic has revealed about the public perception of science. And while they may not have all of the answers to solve the challenges before us, I know they bring with them the kind of passion and wisdom that we all need to move forward. But before we get to our panelists, I would like to, or our full slate of panelists, I'd like to wel welcome Dominique Brassard. Uh, Dominique is a professor and chair of the Department of Life Science Communication, and she's going to help center us in thinking about science and how different publics, and yes, I do mean publics, the public is not a monolith, interpret scientific information against a backdrop of personal values, ideals, and motivations. Dominique's a member of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Executive Committee of the Societal Expert Actions Network, it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's made up of social scientists who provide science-based responses to questions posed by decision makers in the context of COVID-19, and it was created last spring. Dominique, the, dirt, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here and be able to engage with all of you on something that I think for all of us at UW-Madison on campuses around the world, is very important to us. 
the place of science in the decision making that we need to put into place when we face crises such as COVID-19. So Kelly actually posed a very important question. How do people interpret science information and how does that guide them when they make decisions? Well, the issue is, as Kelly said, is like all of us, all those publics, we all come from different roads in life. We all have different backgrounds, different worldviews, different belief systems, different perceptual filters. And at the end of the day, as us social psychologists say, we are cognitive misers, which means we do not like or we cannot actually think through very deeply about anything much that, uh, you know, like our everyday decision making. That means that we're going to use only the, the amount of information we need to reach a specific decision. And to do so, we're going to rely on our values and perceptual filters that give us a way to make sense of things that are very complicated in our life. And very often, scientific issues, particularly those that are, you know, deployed in the midst of crisis, are extremely complicated. And those values we rely on are extremely important to us. And this is where the notion of trust come to be. Trust is one of those shortcuts we use to make sense of scientific information. But you would say, what the trust in whom and what kind of scientific information are the question we need to ponder. Indeed, it may be actually public health official that actually have our trust and we have seen among this pandemic, that local public officials were extremely trusted, but most Americans, as far as like having, you know, like uh, uh, the well-being of our society in mind. Trust in science, you would say, may be actually at risk to be eroded in the context of the pandemic. But I will reassure all of us here that actually hold science in high regards. Americans at large, do so as well. As a matter of fact, uh, a poll released by the Pew Research Center in November highlighted that 84% of Americans believed, and actually I want to quote here, uh, that uh, they had a great deal or fair amount of trust in scientists to act in the public's well, in public interest. 84% of Americans in November. So Americans do trust science. The problem that we have then is what is science? And unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, that's the idea, is science is deployed in society with a wide range of actors. The only one of the actors for which they can provide the information they needed to make decision making. And in context of public health, is, as the, the term indicates, a public issue. And when a public issue is deployed in society and policy decisions are made, other actors come to play. This may be politicians, it may be policymakers in lar at large in agencies, such as CDC, NIH, and so on, but it's also business owners, community organizations, and so on. And then science communication becomes tricky. Because the communication of science is not about science communication. It's a communication of science in a public setting. And in this case, it means really building relationship of trust with the other organizations that are trying to battle in the public good, in the arena of society. So going back to what have we learned about this, uh, this pandemic, I would say that, number one, we need to remember that when we face crisis, science is not alone. Scientists are only one part of the, you know, uh, actors that will be engaged in the public spheres. And we actually have to actually learn to engage in, a, 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 you know, um, a creative and constructive ways. And I have to uh, uh, argue actually that this really happened really well at the local level. I have to commend my colleagues at Dane County and Madison looking at the levels of infections right now, we can say that we've done something well. And I have to commend my colleagues at UW campus to have done well by building those relationships between public health officials, biology, social science, and so on, to co have a common front to acknowledge the crisis and find the best responses. We were able to actually see a light at the end of the tunnel and we'll be able to do it together. Number two, lesson taken, 
is that we shouldn't forget that it will be always crucial to realize that in terms of crisis, what constitutes misinformation one day may not be misinformation the other day or vice versa. Science is consulting evolving in terms of crisis. We making the science as the crisis is deployed. So as scientists, what we need to do and when we need to communicate to all our audiences out there, that if there is uncertainty, we need to acknowledge it. And the science that we are producing right now is based on the best evidence. And tomorrow, we'll, more evidence will allow us to move forward even more in providing the best expert advice that we can. So we should not conceal uncertainty. We should realize we are only one of the actors. And at the end of the day, is by listening to the concerns of the constituencies and the community we are working with, we will be able to move forward in a productive way. Thank you so much for being here, and I hope these few comments will provide the stage for discussion. Thank you so much, Dominique. I'm constantly reminded how fortunate we are to have you here and your colleagues. I think your expertise is really important. Um, I always enjoy learning about the science of science communication. Uh, I, I see it as sort of a guiding light um, in, in taking my responsibility as a science communicator seriously. So thank you so much for, for your work and for joining us on this panel. Um, speaking of this panel, I'd like to introduce you to the other members of the panel tonight. Uh, and we have a, a few and I'm actually very excited about all of them. So um, let me introduce Ajay Sethi. Ajay is an associate professor in population health sciences and an infectious disease epi epidemiologist. He's faculty director of the Master of Public Health program and clap your hands for Ajay. He was a uh, just named uh, one of the Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award recipients. I first got to know Ajay in uh, January of 2020, thanks to his participation in an important and timely panel discussion about the novel coronavirus. It was so new that it didn't even have a name. <laughs> Um, the uh, one year reconvening of that panel virtually will actually take place this coming Wednesday. So you'll have an opportunity to see Ajay again if uh, you tune into that, it's at four o'clock through uh, the School of Medicine and Public Health. Uh, one of our uh, other panelists tonight is Brad Schwartz. Brad is the Chief Executive Officer of the Morgridge Institute for Research, and he's also a UW-Madison Professor of Medicine and Biomolecular Chemistry. Hi, Brad. Uh, the Mortgage Institute, for those who don't know, is a, a private nonprofit research institute dedicated to interdisciplinary biomedical research in partnership with UW-Madison. Brad is a physician scientist whose research and clinical activities focus on blood clotting. He has a deep commitment to the mission of public research universities and the Wisconsin IDEA, and I know he's particularly passionate about our conversation tonight. We are also lucky to be joined by Eric Wilcotts who is the Dean of the College of Letters and Science. Hey, Eric. Eric and I go back uh, several years now. Uh, he joined me and UW-Madison colleagues in South Africa in 2017 to help as we documented the critical scientific endeavors of UW-Madison scientists and collaborators in the country. Wilcotts is the Mary C. Jacoby Professor in the Department of Astronomy, and his research focuses on the evolution and environment of galaxies and groups in which they reside through the lens of radio wavelengths. He continues that line of research through UW's involvement in the Southern African Large Telescope Project, which was one of the reasons he joined us in South Africa. That effort led to an award-winning multimedia story called Origins. Okay, I think we have all of our panelists here between Ajay, Brad, Eric, and Dominique. And um, I know we wanna leave a lot of time for discussion and questions tonight. So I'm gonna stop talking <laughs> other than to uh, ask you all some questions so that we can get some conversation going. But I wanna invite the members of our audience to submit questions as we go and uh, we can ask those of the panelists. So to get us started, um, I think I have a question for you, Ajay. Um, we talked you know, a little bit about trust with, with Dominique's presentation. Um, and the title of tonight's event actually concerns public perception of science. So I think trust is an element of that and particularly in a post-pandemic world. But we're still very much in this pandemic. What do you think our experience over the last 10 months tells us about public trust in science and the institutions that we typically depend on for scientific information? 
Uh, good. That's a good question, Kelly. First, I just want to say I thank you for. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. I, to this question, though, regarding public trust in science, I want to highlight what Dominique said in in her introduction, um, citing the Pew, Pew Research uh, poll from November 2019 that did show those very high levels of trust in scientists, um, you know, across the country. And then, you know, January 1 happens. A lot of people, you know, start off the year with uh, setting new resolutions. And a lot of politicians were starting the year thinking about re-election uh, later in November. The pandemic hits, and, and I can only imagine sort of how some plans for re-election might have been sort of uh, upended a little bit. Um, that same poll that Dominique had sort of cited also, I believe, you know, said that the public is a little divided as to the role scientists should play in uh, in the policy making process, and some of that's correlated with political views. And so, when the pandemic did hit, uh, I think those differences became even more pronounced as politically motivated individuals began to interfere with the functions of agencies, you know, like the CDC. And so we're kind of left a year later where there is a little erosion in such agencies. And I think that's why, you know, the, the new administration has a top priority to try to restore trust in government. Absolutely. Would anyone else like to, to weigh in? I mean, something that I often think about is uh, trust in science and responsibility. So, you know, whose responsibility is it? to foster that trust? Is it the responsibility of scientists? Is it the responsibility of politicians? Is it scientific institutions? Is it the public? Is, does the public play a role here? So Kelly, I'll, I'll jump in on, on that. I think it, it, it must be all of the above. Uh, and, and one of the things certainly the, that I've been involved in and, and very happily so uh, is the Wisconsin Science Festival as an example of a venue that has partly as a mission to engage the public and open up science to the public, to allow the public to develop that trust in science and a deeper understanding of, of what science is and how it works. Um, so I think we've got a responsibility there to engage the public in the science that we do so they can see, you know, to use an overused expression, you know, the sausage getting made. Uh, you know, one of the things that occasionally does frustrate me as a, as a scientist, but also somebody who wants to communicate science and build that trust, is we tend to focus on the result without also shedding light on the process that, that got to that result. And so I think of you know, uh, a couple of years ago, big headlines, all the newspapers showed a, a pretty picture of the image of a black hole. It was on the front page of I think every newspaper around the world. That's a result that is 20, 30, 40 years in the making with fits and starts and a process. And I think it, it, it's up to us to shed a little bit of light on that process so that people understand that there isn't uncertainty along the way, but the process allows us to narrow that uncertainty and, and correct missteps in order to get to in, to get to a result. And Kelly, okay. if I can, if I might, might meet you as well, I think, um, familiarity with science takes place on a number of different levels as well. So I think most people, um, if asked whether science, whether their life is better because of discoveries that were made in science would say, sure. But if you were to ask them if they actually knew scientists or had a firsthand uh, uh, feeling for how science was done, most people would say, well, no. And I think one of the issues that we face today is there is a lot of suspicion of uh, authority and experts. Um, so one of the things that uh, we have as a challenge before us is how to effectively engage with society in a way that will take. And one of the things that we tend to think about is how do we address big groups of people, something like this. So we can do that, but the long-term traction that an, uh, a session like this creates is probably pretty limited. Whereas if uh, 
each of us has an opportunity to form relationships with individuals or small groups, and we get to know each other as people, the likelihood that trust will build and we form a, a foundation for a better understanding of science, I think that that's a, that's a, a very important part of the effort that we have to think about. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so I totally agree with everything. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 You hear Nicole? Yeah. A, a little bit. Let me, I'm going to mute. Yeah, maybe that's why it was. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Uh, uh, so I want to echo what everybody says, but I, I, I think we need to remember that we're talking about very different things here. We're talking about expertise uh, and, and trust in authority, but uh, we need to remember that the science expertise is only one of the voices in the public health, uh, 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 you know, and, and, uh, and we need to realize that public health means making policy decisions. And policy decisions are really a compromise about different types of approaches. So we may have like, yeah, indeed, look, I'm French. In France, they say, um, you know, you have to stay three feet away from people because uh, the reality of France is like in Paris, you cannot stay six feet away. So here it's six feet away. Well, the decision to have the three versus six feet is actually based on scientific expertise, but it's a compromise based on the reality of the so of French society. So I think we need to also realize that the 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 the, the, the when expertise uh, has to actually acknowledge. Uh, that it, it's only one voice. Again, I'm thinking that actually, obviously, um, you know, on the, the presidency of, of Trump, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like a normal deployment of expertise in normal scientific uh, uh, context, if, uh, if you see what I mean. I, but uh, just very briefly before leaving the floor to others, I'd like to address a comment by somebody from the audience, because I think maybe I misspoke. Uh, uh, what I said that the science of today uh, may be wrong tomorrow i meant that it's incremental i think eric actually explained how you know we try to reduce uncertainty right that's the idea that we have the best approximation approximation to, to to truth however when the science is deployed in the public sphere through communication and is deployed at certain such as with the mask fiasco that we had in the early times of the pandemic it was portrayed that the scientific uh, you know, uh, evidence that we didn't need to wear masks, that they, they needed to be held, they be reserved to the healthcare workers. But then that, that was corrected later on by saying, yes, we do need to wear masks. So yeah, in that case, it wasn't science that was wrong. It's the way the scientific input was deployed in the public sphere. And that's the, 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 the thing that I wanted to point out when I was talking about misinformation. Yeah, I'd like to to push on that a little bit, um, and, and this is probably good for for Ajay and and Dominique, and obviously Brad and Eric. You're welcome to uh, to weigh in. But you know, we talk, I think, as as people who trust in science about science as a process rather than science as a collection of facts. And you know, it occurs to me that a lot of people do conceive of science as more the facts that you need to know because maybe that's how you learned it in school. You memorize something to pass your biology test, um, but Science is also communicated in an environment where uh, certain people might express a lot of certainty about a position or an idea. And science, on the other hand, has to be conveyed in a responsible way, expressing that uncertainty and allowing for the process of science to take place. So how can those two things exist in tension? How can, you, how can we communicate the process of science without also um, conveying a lot of doubt or or giving people the impression that you know science isn't isn't uh, something to be trusted you know I think if, if all scientists could just sort of have a, a flashback of their dissertation defense where they have to defend every statement they make and then use that sort of mindset when we communicate to the public we might you know insert more caveats uh, think of our statements as potentially being actionable by some individuals, and and when we think about the actions people may take, um, things that can be harmful for you uh, because of what you're saying, 
uh, you know, you might take a step back and, and realize that maybe you overstated things. And so maybe putting yourself in the shoes of people in your audience can help. Yeah, and the second thing that we often say in risk communication is like trust in the messenger is very often more important than the content of the message itself. So maybe sometimes it's not the scientist that should be the messenger. Maybe actually a trust leader in a community, a faith leader and so on, at time of crisis might be the best person to actually talk about some things that might be controversial. So I think we may take up all of us humility to sometimes stay out of the equation, that we as scientists shouldn't always be part of the conversation. We can provide a scientific input, but then at the end of the day, the conversation and the engagement should also allow for those multiple voices that Ajay was mentioning. You know, I also think we shouldn't be afraid to uh, not be certain about something. You know, I, I think that uh, um, people trust you more if you're honest about what you know and you don't know. I, I remember when I was in medical school, there was this one really remarkable pathology professor. And we used to say, this guy is so smart, he can stand in front of a, a room of 90 medical students and say, I don't know. So we shouldn't feel the pressure to have the answers. We should be honest with people. And actually social science will back up your point, Brad. We actually have evidence to show that acknowledging the limit of our knowledge actually increases trust. Imagine a professor in the classroom, right? That actually says something is uncertain and the following day it proves that to be true. How do the students feel about that professor, right? It's like, and, the, and we have numerous evidence that actually support that fact. A member of the audience actually brings up a really good point, which is, Sure, there's uncertainty in science, and I think most of us get behind that, but particularly in a year where we saw the real profound implications of science in real time, as this pandemic has played out, people are really craving certainty. So how can we encourage people to turn to sound scientific information, right, in an environment where people want that certainty? And there might be, you know, maybe uh, certain people with, with poor motives who are promising more certainty than there might be. If I, I might uh, speak up on this, I can tell you that um, in, in the care of individual patients, they certainly want certainty. But I can tell you that they respond much more with much more trust if you're honest and completely transparent about mm -hmm. what we know and what we don't know and what kind of, um, I don't want to use the word certainty, but um, how confident we are in our recommendations and why. And they may be frustrated because they'd rather have certainty, but the vast, vast majority of people understand the uncertainty of the world and are willing to, to go with that and be a partner in it. I think on that is another related question from the audience, which is about uh, how we communicate science. And I know Dominique has spoken to this a bit tonight. Um, we tend to read stories in the popular press, you know, that has a, a they have a flashy headline and they, you know, maybe um, profess a certain level of certainty in the exercise of trying to communicate or convey some new idea that, that might be very exciting. And I think you know, we see this a lot in, in the astronomical world, right, where this is a great picture of a black hole. So, you know, we're not all um, equipped equally, right, with the ability to sort of evaluate scientific information. So what responsibility might the media have and might scientists have in sort of setting those that tone and that expectation appropriately? We want to get exciting news out, but, but how do we do it in a way that really appropriately contextualizes it? I think it's. I think it's a great. It's a great question, um, and I think you know, some of it you might be in in the media in how we convey science, and when we do have a result, a discovery, part of the excitement of that from the scientific perspective is that it has probably eliminated some other alternate explanations 
or some other things that we once thought might have been the way the world works. Maybe we should make a point of that as we talk about the discovery and how exciting it is that, yeah, and this rules out this other explanation. Um, so I think that might be that might be part of it. Yeah, we don't spend a lot of time in in science talking about the stuff that we know isn't true because we're always trying to push the frontier to find out what is true. But but part of that pushing the frontier, and this is something too that you now when I'm working with students to engage them, even if their result isn't doesn't prove anything or doesn't really show anything, it might rule out something. And that is equally important. Um, and so I think we've got to make sure we talk about that as part of the process as well. Yeah, Dominique. Yeah, if I, if I may, uh, when uh, uh, adding to what Eric just uh, said, we have a lot of scientific insights from the science of science communication that actually have been deployed since this became a field that's uh, recognized by the National Academy of Science and so on. And uh, uh, with the different social scientists working with major newspapers uh, to actually communicate this thing, you know, Kelly working with us and so on. So, for example, Laura Helmuth, when she was the science editor at the Washington Post, uh, she was working on the science of science communication uh, panel at the Academy. She was actually instrumental in changing the way the Washington Post actually was writing the headlines. Uh, but for example, as we know, repeating misinformation is not good because it makes it more salient in people's minds. What you need to do is actually you know, communicate the right information as much as possible first in order to, uh, you know, not make that misinformation salient in people that didn't have it in the first place. So they made a point, you know, in uh, at, uh, at uh, the Washington Post to actually make sure the headlines wouldn't actually point to misinformation. See, look what's going on that people don't believe. Not good. So I think this is also part of the process that all of us together, news organizations are part of the of the solution as we move forward post-pandemic to actually learn from our mistakes. Yeah, let's let's pick on that a little bit, Dominique, because you know, you and I have talked about vaccine hesitancy. And I think we have vaccines. We had this, you know, almost near miracle uh process by which two vaccines came to, to market very quickly for COVID-19. Um and you know, and probably for me, as much as headlines sort of proclaiming how great this is, I saw equally as, as many headlines talking about how how many people were too afraid to take it or vaccine hesitancy. Does that kind of communication overplay the, the situation? And does it risk actually encouraging more people to be hesitant about taking a COVID vaccine? Yeah, great question. And Ajay can also uh, comment on that. But, you know, like uh, one of the, the conclusions we had in the, one of our recent National Academy of Science report on vaccine hesitancy and preventing behavior is that you don't, you really need to avoid pointed, uh, you know, a behavior that you don't want to encourage. Uh, you need to point to the other behavior. And what we can say is actually vaccine hesitancy is decreasing dramatically. If you compare the number of Americans that are hesitant toward the vaccine from September to now, that has decreased. More and more Americans are willing to be vaccinated. This is what we need to point, not those that don't want to be uh, vaccinated, but actually that people more and more are coming and that, you know, they are actually seeing uh, the, the advantages of vaccinations. And as a matter of fact, it's normal for people to be hesitant. They just have questions. They have concerns. Let's address them. Let's actually give them answers and listen where they're coming from. From, and then we can actually make sure that we move it to the right direction. I'm sure AJ has things to say because he's, uh, uh, you know, like the proponent of listening to people. I'm, I'm nodding my head. Uh, I, I, I agree with what you, you're saying. I think the people who get vaccines every day, you know, are able to resume their days just fine, don't experience any major adverse events. Um, you know, it was not a big deal for them. We don't give them a voice in a sense. We always tend to, to cling on to the ones that don't sort of have the same experience. And we don't want that to be the normative feeling because that is not the normative feeling. I might also say that um, sometimes the, uh, the carrier of the message uh, actually has uh, other objectives other than just getting the information across. And we see this a lot in the medical arena. 
where institutional uh, press officers want to get information out because they want to trumpet how great their institution is in an effort to attract patients. That's a different goal than accurately representing the scientific advance and transmitting the excitement of new knowledge. And it obviously makes the whole process more complicated, but I think we have to be realistic about that. Yeah, thanks, Brad. I think we've, we've talked a little bit about that, right? The, uh, the motivations of the, the communicator or the venue through which that science is shared, right? Because scientists are, are human beings and obviously institutions have their own motivations. And I think this kind of gets back at this idea of, of how can we help people evaluate information and uh, make sense of, of what they're learning. And this actually ties into a question uh, that somebody asked specifically about you know, how pharmacists can communicate with members of the community and with healthcare workers. And I think this ties in with some of the, the discussion we've had today about, about trust building, but trust building and the messenger and how can, and can we accurately and helpfully frame information for people? And who should those messengers be? I think that's another another question I have. And Dominique, you mentioned faith leaders, but um, you know we have a, a panel of, of scientists here. Um, do you expect the public listens to you? Who should they be listening to? So that's a great question. And actually, I you know like that. I think the question from the audience is a uh, uh, future pharmacies, right? That communicate with member of the community healthcare workers. So I would say before thinking of who should they listen to, I think we should listen to them. So, I mean, when we say the, the, the people that are hesitant about getting the COVID-19 vaccine in the community, you know, I would need to know why, what are their concerns? Do they think it was rush? Do they think it was the clinical trials were not actually very well conducted? And so on. There's, there's been a wide range of reasons why people are hesitant. Or is it just because they're against vaccines, which, by the way, only a very small fraction of the American population is against vaccines. It's like, so like people have are hesitance and, you know, people have concerns. I always say there's no right or wrong concerns. They're concerns. So we need to listen to them. And as a matter of fact, I, mean, I think that the, the Dane County Public Health Bureau has been doing a great job. They've actually been communicating about and addressing all those concerns. And, and, and that's been uh, very good. And I think as soon as people feel they're heard, this really builds trust. And that's the, really the key in the context of this issue. Yeah, you know, I'll chime in with a couple of things. With, repeating what Dominique said, that building that trust is so key. And I'll put in a plug for my conspiracies in public health class where we teach future clinicians to do more listening than talking whenever they can to, in order to build that trust and to really understand where patients are coming from. You know, a, a, a lot of... Um, analysis of states uh, rollout of the vaccine has kind of highlighted uh, West Virginia, uh, who's kind of led the, the US in rollout. And leaders there will, will cite the fact that they sort of abandoned the, the, the approach that the other 49 states took, which was to rely on chain pharmacies to roll out the vaccine, but instead to rely on their network of 250 mom and pop shop pharmacists. Uh, because they have relationships with people in the community, they already knew who they needed to vaccinate. I think it points to what the uh, the question was about. That is building that trust and relationship with community members is so important. Yeah, I I would say one of the, I, I agree completely. And one of the um, characteristics of the community pharmacy, pharmacist is they're just like me. This is somebody I know as a person. This is not a talking head that's trying to talk to thousands of people at once. And I think this is going to be one of the tough things for um, scientists at universities to do more of, which is to get out there and to use the parlance of politics to have a ground game and go out there and interact with small groups of people. When my kids were little, I used to love going to their uh, science classes and talking to them. And it was just terrific. Um, here at the University of Wisconsin, we have something called Founders Day, where faculty members get to participate by visiting uh, groups of alums around the state and around the country. And those are invariably um, fun. 
and you end up meeting people and getting to know them pretty well. And I would submit that the um, transmission of trusted knowledge takes place pretty dependably in those settings. And I think we shouldn't uh, keep ourselves from going out and interacting with members of our community, you know, community groups, et cetera, uh, that are looking for speakers. And uh, we should embrace the opportunity to do that. Brad, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think fundamentally that's part of the the DNA of the institution, right? I think you're, you're expressing the Wisconsin idea in, in, in a way that isn't often expressed, but it is an important part of what we do. I um, mean, engaging in it, it's not, it's not just the, you know, the groups that gather in Founders Day, because that is, a, in a sense, a, you know, that's, that's the home team. <laughs> Uh, there, there are alums who, who, who show up wearing, wearing Badger Red, but it is, I think, really engaging the community. And we've got colleagues who, who at, at uh, our Trout Lake station up in Minocqua are routinely out engaging the public around that in conversations about lake health. Um, we, we have the Speakers Bureau as, as faculty and staff out across the state in different venues engaging, I think, as, as Kelly was saying earlier, the different publics. Uh, in in the science in a way that th where, where we sort of meet folks where they are as you say and part of it is getting to to introduce scientists as being humans uh, with with the same the same concerns and the same passions and the same issues as everyone else uh, and I think that's re that's really important to, to building that trust in the scientific process so that when, it is, and when, as Dominique was saying earlier, when science does then meet public concern, when it meets questions of, of my welfare and my job, folks do have that opportunity to say, yeah, I understand how the science works, but yeah, I'm going to blend it with these other concerns that I have and, and be able to reach a decision. Speaking of concerns, I'm very glad that a member of the audience asked this question because I was hoping to raise it. Um, you know, different communities have different levels of trust, right, uh, in science or specific areas of science. And, you know, sometimes that's rooted in, in beliefs or value systems, and sometimes that's rooted in, in real uh, historic experiences that have been very negative in the sciences. What do we need to do to, to work past some of that? And I'm thinking specifically about, you know, healthcare and, and as the, the audience member mentions, you know, healthcare, historical mistreatment of, of black Americans. I mean, I think there are communities in, in this country that have very good reasons to be mistrustful of science, of, of vaccines, of the healthcare profession. What do we do about that? What's our responsibility? I'm gonna just quickly interject and say, before we can say the words, trust me, I'm a scientist with a straight face, we, I think we have to own up to the fact that our peers sometimes you know, have done things that we would not do ourselves or, and we should be ashamed of. We kind of have to own that. We got to take responsibility for our fuels. And in the in the spirit of, you know, see something, say something, we have to speak out about it. Uh, not to cancel sort of people's views necessarily, but, but to have a very nuanced discussion about things that have occurred in the past, apologize for it first and foremost, and then try to rebuild trust from there. I think that that's essential. I think we have to acknowledge it. And then we also have to promise that this won't happen again on my watch or on our watch. And then we have to be completely transparent and say, come sit next to me and you can see everything that I see. Yeah, totally echo like that, that idea that you have to own it and you have to make sure that we don't repeat the horrible mistakes of the past. And there's always the future and the future is going to be better. And I was uh, uh, listening to an African-American doctor actually on NPR today that was talking about uh, vaccine hesitancy that's actually uh, more important among, among the African-American population because of the, the issue that the audience member is raising. And that was actually mentioning that actually the trials for the vaccine right now now have included a more diverse type of uh, population than clinical trials in general. So we need to actually mention that as well, that this is the kind of things that need to change in the future. And I think an even longer term way of addressing this is to make sure the scientific disciplines look like the population. 
And so that helps build that level of trust, that level of connectivity, that level of, of I can see somebody who is doing science who looks like me, shares my background, shares where, where I'm from, that will help. That's a longer term solution uh, to the, in addition to other things that have been said. Eric, I just yeah. want to comment on what you react to what you just said about sort of looking at scientists, they look like me. And I think it's also nice if we can connect with the public to, so they can recognize that everybody uses the scientific process every day. Uh, trial and error is, is how you sometimes <laughs> fix what's broken around the house. Uh, we all do information gathering, which is a form of data collection to really make people feel, help people feel that they can be a scientist. They might not get paid uh, to do that for a living, but they act in very scientific ways, uh, maybe without knowing it. And, and to echo that, uh, IJ, I think like a comment from a, an audience member, a recent comment that says that, you know, it seems that the, it appears that it's selective acceptance of uh, science that people, that's just when human activity is, is concerned that there may be a problem. And this is true because what happened is that when it is a, a controversial scientific topic, very often it's scientific, but also has, sorry about my dog ethical, legal, and social implication, which means that other people need to come to the table to discuss it. And I think that's where potential we may have issues about the science being selectively uh, uh, accepted. I think some of that is, is on us as scientists to recognize that, yes, we, we are scientists, but there are points where our science does have a real impact on people, right? I, I come from a discipline. We're lucky enough that the people we don't have real impact on on humans right uh, and and, and I, the example i used earlier in, in other conversations that's been used before so when we had that total eclipse a couple of years ago right the scientific the astronomical community informed the world that there was going to be a total eclipse on a certain day on a certain time and millions of people got in their cars and bought airline tickets and planned their vacations all trusting this right that this event was going to happen it didn't really have an impact on somebody's well-being or their health of their family or whether the, the source of their employment was going to close. And so I think Dominique's point that we as scientists have to recognize that there are other factors that come into play um, and be cognizant of that and help those other participants in this discussion come to, come to the right decisions. I'd like to take a, just a small tangent on that. We, we talked before about um, the political conversation in the country, uh, uh, shading trust of science. I think one of the things that is really important is that we uh, uh, avoid getting into the political argument. And I think one of the things that has happened is that um, people have uh, brought into the conversation opinions about other people's intelligence. If they don't believe in uh, information that's delivered by scientists. And that's a completely non-productive way to have a conversation. If you start off a conversation and you impugn somebody's intelligence, then you have just lost any chance of communicating effectively. And we should remember that. We should remember the goal that we're aiming for. I think that gets a little bit at something you, you brought up earlier too, Brad, about, you know, distrust of authority and, and sort of this idea that, you know, maybe scientists or institutions are, are coming from a, an elitist place and, and are not relevant to the individuals for whom, you know, we would like that science to, to settle. An audience member asked a question about um, scientific literacy and kind of turning this back around and, and on this on this very subject, Brad, are we doing enough uh, at the level of primary education to maybe inspire the kind of awe that people have when they hear about an eclipse or experience an eclipse, but, but maybe lose when it comes to, you know, a, a member of the government saying one day don't wear masks and the next day wear a mask. What, what role does this scientific literacy play? Or is that even the right question to ask? You know, that's a good question. I think um, one of the things that is evident to me is it is part of every human being to have a tendency to turn over the next rock 
and see what's underneath there. You know, we're just intrinsically curious. And in much of science education, it has been um, put forward as a group or I mean, as a series of tasks to be uh, completed and boxes to check off. And we've lost the wonder. I mean, the reason so many people bought airline tickets to go see the, uh, uh, the eclipse is people were filled with a sense of wonder. And here was an opportunity to indulge that as if we were little kids again. And it's one of the reasons that so many really cool scientific discoveries get a lot of publicity and a lot of print is because people just say, wow. And I wish I had the answer to, as to how science education and literacy could be structured in a way that could maintain that. But I think that's key. Thanks, Brad. I have a very specific question from the panel, but I think Ajay will uh, want to speak to this one. Uh, and this concerns the messenger and misinformation. I think we have a theme tonight. <laughs> Should scientific officials or scientists, and in this case, uh, CDC's Deborah Burks, should she have spoken out earlier about misinformation sort of in in the moment? And I think, you know, Dr. Fauci also spoke to this as well about his reluctance to sort of speak out against his boss, the president at, at the time. How should scientists approach sharing information that might be unpopular with an institution or, or a president? Um, since I was prompted, I guess I can say that, uh, you know, I saw both interviews, or I read the interview with Dr. Fauci and saw the interview with Dr. Burks, and I'll say they were in very different positions uh, where Dr. Burks was, uh, you know, working in the White House for the White House while, uh, you know, Dr. Fauci had an advisory role to the White House and had another full-time job being director of NIAID. So, in a sense, they both were in the difficult position where they wanted their voices to be heard. And if you say something that's going to cause you to be dismissed or no longer be consulted, then you, you'll never get your voice heard. So you got to toe this line. I think Dr. Burks, her full-time job was the White House Coronavirus Task Force, while you know Dr. Fauci's you know had was playing multiple roles, and he was he was really in the periphery. I think it's unfair, I think, to to criticize Dr. Burks saying that she should have said something earlier. I think she was saying a lot of things. I don't think she was given a megaphone. Uh, other people were sort of stealing the mic uh, and maybe, you know, causing her not to be able to express herself freely. And in order to continue her important role, she was towing a very difficult line. Indeed. So we have two questions that I think I'm going to try to uh, to wrap into one. The first question is, what role can large institutions, and speaking <laughs> as a, a an employee of one of those large institutions, you know, what role can a, a large institution like ours create or play in trust-based interactions with the public? And the second question that is that is related, and so I'm going to tie these together, is you know, how do we reconcile the need to communicate about science with a media environment that is looking for you know, the next big flashy headline? Um, and I think they, they mentioned that, that you know, maybe it's a question for me as well. So uh, you know, as somebody who communicates about science, I, I see my job first and foremost. Uh, I'm responsible to the taxpaying public of Wisconsin and, and more broadly to, to society. So my job is to accurately convey science. And that means, as we've discussed on this panel, like also conveying the caveats and the, the, the what we don't know. Um, in my uh, communications, I always try to, to at least include a little bit about sort of where we came from. How did a scientist get interested in this question? What, what process or, or what information are we correcting with this new information? And then what questions does it still leave us with? Because I think as scientists, we know that every you know, query leads to, to more questions than answers. Um, as scientists, how, how can we do this? And specifically, how can we do this with, you know, maybe if you talk to Laura Helmuth, who's now Scientific American, you know, she knows 
the history and the science and the science of science communication here. But what about, you know, talking to a television reporter, right? TV has a, a much more diverse audience than say Scientific American. So how as an institution, as a scientist in, at an institution, how can you convey accuracy with also that uncertainty? How do you get that message across? I want to start by this, saying, number one, you need to build a relationship of trust with the journalist. So that means that uh, uh, you need that if a journalist is trained to, to uh, contact you, you need to respond right away. You need to realize their lives. They're under tight deadline. You need to actually get trained to interact with journalists because you need to give them sound bites that communicate what you want in a form that they can take. So if you give them a super long answer to something that's going to end up on in TV for that second, you know, sentence, you need to realize that, that that's not going to get on TV. So I think, number one, if you're interested in being part of the conversation, you need to acknowledge the work of those that are on the other side of the aisle, the journalists, understand where they're coming from, why they're portraying things a certain way. And it's your responsibility to communicate in a way that they can use. Number two, actually, I I firmly believe on the Wisconsin idea. I firmly believe in the land grant mission. And I would like to echo, I don't know if it's uh, one of my uh, panelist colleagues here that said, you know, I say yes to any type of talk I can give in a public library, in a, in a retirement home, in a, anything. I'm part of the public speaker bureau. And I mean, actually, I'm happy to talk to people and go where they are. I think as scientists, we need to realize we need to go where people are. And right now, we have a distinguished audience that's lucky enough to have broadband internet to listen to us that can be at home listening to us but not everybody can do that right and post covid i think we need to be ready to actually get out of our little ivory tower and where we are and go where people are and we're lucky also to have an extension season is amazing and they are counting extension people that are in the counties and we we could work with them as well so i think we're in a really good space to uh, to uh, to do that, and I have to commend actually Mir and Warf and and to, to actually do these kind of things. That's exactly what the Wisconsin idea is about. All right, maybe maybe one more uh, comment if anybody wants to weigh in. I think we have just a few minutes left. Otherwise, we can turn it over. So, last oh. call. <laughs> go ahead, Brad. Well, I was going to say, <clears throat> I, I would close by reminding uh, everybody that. Faculty members at the University of Wisconsin really cherish the Wisconsin idea and, and would like to uh, get out there and uh, meet citizens of Wisconsin. And so I would urge everybody to invite somebody that you know or find out a way to meet somebody and invite them. And I would urge all of my fellow faculty members to remind your colleagues how important this is. That's an excellent call to action and a good reminder in a post-pandemic world of the best way to move forward in helping bring other people along. Thank you so much, panelists, for uh, for all of your knowledge tonight. And uh, I'm going to bring it back to Gabriella, who's got some information to share with us. Yeah, thank you all so much for a fascinating conversation. Hope you all, all in the audience took away some uh, some great Great thoughts uh, as you go forward. A couple notes. The recording of today's session will be available at discovery.wisc.edu under the video section within the next day. And the link uh, to that was just dropped in the chat. Join us for the next session of Crossroads on February 18 at 5 p.m. for a second look at the health of our democracy in the wake of the events of the past month. We'll be sending out an email in the coming days. Thank you all for joining us for Crossroads of Ideas. Take care.